Good afternoon and welcome to the latest monthly virtual general membership meeting. My name is Steve Lamont and I serve as the chair of the South Orange County Economic Coalition, as well as the executive officer for the Building Industry Association of Southern California, Orange County chapter. Today, we're taking a look at the San Onofre Nuclear Generating Station. For decades, this iconic plant located south of San Clemente provided clean, reliable power to Southern California. Since it was retired in 2013, a great deal of work has been done behind the scenes to decommission the facility and begin deconstruction of the plant. Ultimately, the land where the plant sits will be restored and returned to the Navy. But today we'll hear about that work, some of the challenges, and what's next for SALT. So first, I'd like to welcome Manuel Camargo. Manuel, welcome. Thank you for having me, I appreciate that. Yeah, Manuel has worked in public affairs and public relations for 35 years in consulting firms and in corporations. He's been with SCE for over a decade and today works in strategic planning and stakeholder engagement for songs. Most recently, Manuel led a team at SCE that worked with a stable of independent national experts in spent fuel management, who helped develop a strategic plan for the relocation of spent nuclear fuel to an off-site facility. And we'll have more on the strategic plan later. And so, Manuel, we have we have a packed day today, and I got a lot of questions for you. And so, I'm just going to start with the first one here. Uh, what can you tell us about songs and uh, the plant's history? Very good. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, and I appreciate again this opportunity. Um, we do have kind of a long history here, and 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 those of us who work at Songs are quite proud of that, actually. So, uh, Songs produce clean electricity for Southern California Edison customers from 1968 until 2012. So right about 44 years. Uh, and during that time, songs that, that, that clean power was right about 20% of the total portfolio that we delivered to customers. Um, we did, as you've already stated, we retired the plant in 2013. And when we did that, we did establish uh, some guiding principles in order to inform our approach. And, um, and there are three of them, it's safety, stewardship, and engagement. So safety, number one, uh, as always, is uh, means means a few different things in our world. Certainly nuclear safety and, and, and being mindful of the radiation um, that we need to contain. Um, so uh, radiological safety is number one. We also uh, are very focused on industrial safety because the decommissioning process uh, is, is quite significant. The second is stewardship. And so stewardship, too, means a few different things. So certainly being good stewards of the environment. Um, but also our customers have prepaid for the decommissioning process. And so we also uh, look to be very good stewards of every dollar that we've collected over time uh, because they really prepaid. And we have all the funding that we need at present to be able to finish that de decommissioning process. And then the third is engagement. And engagement means a few different things. Uh, one of those is that we formed a community engagement panel back in 2014. And, and I would highlight that the South Orange County Economic Coalition, Coalition has had a member uh, of its board of directors on our CEP since it was formed back in 2014. So for many years, uh, that was uh, Jim Leach. And then today uh, we do have Mike Balsamo uh, who volunteers on the panel. So again, those are our guiding principles, uh, safety, stewardship, and engagement. And those are the things that, that help guide our work through the decommissioning process. Awesome, fascinating. And uh, I definitely honor that our organization is a part of that. Uh, and you just mentioned uh, two great individuals that have served a lot. Uh, served for many years on our board. And so uh, on to the next one. Uh, what is happening right now at Songs? Yeah, so going back just a little bit in time. So in 2019, we, we finished getting all of the permits that we needed through the various state agencies uh, and a, a significant environmental permitting process. And so by October of 2019, we had all those uh, permits in place. And that, that freed us up to begin the actual dismantlement process. Um, so today, the, the work on site boils down to two things. It's dismantling the plant structures and then safely storing the spent fuel. So first, with respect to dismantling the plant, uh, we started that process last year in 2020, and, uh, and it's a years long, very meticulous process. So that will continue until about 2028. So um, what that really means, the current, the current phase of, of dismantlement is uh, removing the above grade structures, including the, the iconic domes that you can see, you know, when you're headed down the five freeway. Um, 
And so, so those are the, the, the above ground structures are what we're focused on now. And at the end of this current phase, again, around the, the, the late 2020s, all that will remain is a switchyard that will, re that will remain. It's an important interconnect between the Southern California Edison and the San Diego gas and electric grids. Uh, so that will remain. We have a dry storage facility for the spent fuel and that'll stay there. And then we also have a, a seawall and a walkway uh, along the, the waterfront. And so those will remain as well. Everything else, including the domes, by around 2028, uh, all that will be gone. And I would say we do have a nice uh, uh, short video that um, that provides a, a good sort of animated uh, view of that uh, decommissioning process and, and the sequence. So I think we're going to play that for you now. Once dismantlement of San Onofre nuclear plant begins, safety and environmental stewardship will guide the process every step of the way. Southern California Edison selected the team of AECOM and Energy Solutions for this project, one of the largest commercial nuclear plant decommissioning projects in the world. This animation illustrates a conceptual technical approach which will be refined during the detailed planning process. The initial demolition will focus on clearing areas of the property to facilitate staging and seamless loading and removal of debris. This demolition on the north side will also clear space for a rail spur to allow for transportation of debris, such as concrete and rebar. Next, the team will create a path down to the intake area by removing the turbine buildings, creating access to the west side of the property. After this work is complete, the buildings between the containment domes will be demolished. Temporary structures will be used during demolition to control dust and other debris. Areas within the safety, fuel, and nearby buildings will be demolished internally. In the final stage, the containment buildings will be demolished using a bottom-up technique that has proven effective in prior nuclear plant decommissioning projects. Soil materials will be used to create a level surface, the final step in fully restoring the site for unrestricted use. San Onofre's used nuclear fuel, which is regulated as high-level radioactive waste, will remain on site in a robust steel and concrete storage facility until the federal government provides an off-site facility as required. The San Onofre decommissioning team is committed to environmental stewardship and remaining engaged with the community throughout the decommissioning project. So yeah, so that's a, a very high level uh, overview of a, a long uh, and meticulous eight year process. And I would mention as well, that video as well as other resources are on a dedicated website, www.sanscommunity.com. So if you have uh, folks who might be interested, um, you know, you can point them to that website to see the video themselves. Um, but moving on, so I mentioned that, you know, we're, we're uh, dismantling the, the plant, but then the second piece is uh, storing the spent fuel on site. And so uh, we do that today. And, and I would start by indicating that the format of the spent fuel is a, a ceramic format. So if you can see that, that is a uh, replica of one fuel pellet. So right about the size of an eraser and, uh, and it's in solid format. So all that spent fuel now is cool enough. Again, we haven't run the plant since 2012. So that spent fuel, all the spent fuel on site at Songs has been uh, repackaged into stainless steel canisters. These are 5 h of an inch thick stainless steel canisters that are designed actually both for on-site storage and then for off-site transportation. So we're already looking forward to um, uh, getting the spent fuel off-site and the spent fuel is packaged for transportation now. Um, these structures are very robust um, size, uh, seismically. They are some of the strongest uh, structures that I think you can find certainly in California and probably across the country. Um, and, uh, and so the structures are, are covered. Each of the, each of the uh, um, silos that has one of these spent fuel canisters is covered with a 35,000 pound lid. And, um, and those do a number of things that uh, protect, uh, protect the, um, 
the, the spent fuel, um, but they also uh, contain the radiation. So you could actually sit on one of these 35,000 pound lids as if you're an employee, it's not accessible to the public. Um, and, um, and you would be fine from a radiological perspective. So um, I would mention as well that, uh, you know, we do try to be transparent as, try to, as part of our commitment to uh, engagement. And we do have a radiation monitoring system that we've set up around the perimeter of the spent fuel facility. And uh, we stream data in real time to a couple of local agencies. And then also importantly to the uh, California Department of uh, Public Health. They have a radiological health branch with professionals who understand these issues. And so they, the California Department of Public Health, produce monthly reports that are available on our website. So that's the second key component of what we're doing on site uh, here at Songs. Yeah, well, thank you. That video uh, made the deconstruction process look pretty easy, uh, but I'm, I'm assuming that's a very complex and technical uh, deconstruction process. Um, but it seems like when that is done, your work is just starting uh, again. And so once the uh, above ground structures are all removed, I, I guess what comes next? Yeah, good question, uh, because there is much more to come. Um, the uh, Once this current phase is done with all the above ground structures and those are cleared out, um, then that will allow us to remove the, uh, we need to get the spent fuel off site. So once we get the spent fuel off site, then we will be in a position to restore the land, which is one of our priorities. That goes into the stewardship piece, right? So we really want to restore the land and return it to the Navy. Uh, I think folks recognize that uh, the Songs facility is on uh, Marine Corps Base Camp Pendleton. And, um, and of course, the, the you know, Marines are part of the Navy. And we actually did just receive another confirmation from the, um, uh, from the military that they want the land back. Uh, very recently, uh, Brigadier General uh, uh, Conley uh, um, sent us a, a note to indicate that the uh, Marines see that the perpetual storage of spent fuel on site at San Onofre is inconsistent with their, um, uh, with their mission of training Marines. So, so that's what comes next. We'll restore the site, give the land back to the Marines, and then the Marines will use it in order to uh, fulfill their, um, their uh, training mission. Okay, very good. Well, thank you. Uh, and so you kind of alluded to it earlier uh, when we started, but uh, who pays for the dish uh, the decommissioning of songs. Yeah, it's our it's uh, customers, customers, uh, utility customers who receive the electricity over time. So uh, those customers uh, have been paying in um, since the beginning, and uh, unfortunately, we're in a position here with uh, both those contributions and uh, with accrued interest that we have all the funding that we need at present in order to uh, uh, decommission the the plant. So all that all those funds uh, re uh, reside in trust funds. And we're using those trust funds now in order to pay. So it, it really is those customers who enjoyed that uh, good, clean electricity who prepaid. And we're now um, using those funds for the decommissioning process. Fascinating. So my last question, uh, kind of on the same topic, but uh, the disposal of the spent nuclear fuel, uh, who pays for that? So, yeah. So that's really kind of a similar question, just yeah. more at a national yeah. level. So the... All nuclear utility customers across the country paid what was called one mil for, uh, which is a tenth of a penny for each kilowatt hour of electricity wow. that they consumed. And so uh, as a country, we've collected over 40 billion with a B, 40 billion dollars to pay for that, uh, the long term disposal of the spent yeah. fuel. So, uh, in fact, they've paid in so much that the uh, collections have actually stopped at this stage. So the funding exists in order to get the, uh, in order to pay for the disposition of the wow, okay. uh, spent fuel. Okay, well, Manuel, thank you. That is all uh, that I have for you today, but we do have some questions from the public uh, submitted via video. And so the first one is from Anthony Breed, uh, whose question is gonna be about the threat of a tsunami. Uh, so we'll kick it over to Anthony. Could, the San Onofre be at risk of the tsunami, um, just like the tsunami that happened to the nuclear power plant in Fukushima. Is there uh, anything at risk about that? So if there was a major earthquake that California experienced uh, and a tidal wave uh, hit uh, around the San Onofre um, power plant, is there any danger of the same thing happening here as did in Japan? Okay, Anthony, thank you for that question. Uh, Manuel, then I'll kick it to you. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. And thank you, Anthony, for the question. Um, we do actually have a very good handle on the um, 
uh, on the tsunami risk in the San Onofre area. In 2017, the Scripps Oceanographic Institute wrapped up some new research for us, um, one phase of which had to do with the tsunami risk. And short story is that the uh, maximum credible tsunami at the San Onofre site is right about uh, a little less than 10 feet. And as I mentioned before, when I was talking about the dismantlement process, that we have this seawall. So that seawall that protects the site, including the spent storage facility, is uh, 28 feet tall. So we do know that the, the most credible tsunami is, is right about 10 feet. And so, you know, we're up at 28 feet in terms of a seawall that protects us. Um, and just a couple of things to, to note, um, there's really two reasons for that, uh, that, that feed into that understanding. So one is that uh, locally, the under underwater uh, geologic structures uh, do not lend themselves to uh, a large underwater landslide. That, that can create what's called a near field tsunami. And then in terms of a far field tsunami that might come from Alaska or from uh, Asia, um, there's uh, something called the California borderlands. Just think of it as almost like speed bumps uh, underwater. And so any kind of far field tsunami would be knocked down by those California bo uh, borderlands that provide sort of a baffling effect on uh, a a tsunami that come, would come from further away. So, so that's what we know. And, and fortunately, we do have that as, as pretty recent research just wrapped up in 2017. Awesome. Well, thank you. Yeah. And I know, I know that's probably one of the first questions you get uh, being in this industry about the tsunami. So, uh, and it is obviously the first question we got from the audience. So uh, gr great, uh, great information. Next, we're going to go to uh, Candace Burroughs. And she wants to know uh, kind of what you alluded to earlier, but what happens to the land uh, after uh, the decommissioning is complete. And so we're going to hear from uh, Candace. Assuming a location can be found to store the spent nuclear fuel cells, what happens to the land? Does it get turned back over to the Navy for marine training at Camp Pendleton, or will it go to the public? Could you please uh, explain a little more about that? Thank you. Candace, thank you. Uh, Manuel, your response. Yeah, thank you, Candace. Um, so good question. Uh, the so a couple of things. The I mentioned earlier uh, that we had gone through the state permitting process for the above ground structures. That's what's called the California Environmental Quality Act. There's a national equivalent to that that some folks may be uh, aware of called the National Environmental Policy Act. And so once we're once we get the spent fuel off site, what comes next? is we'll go through the NEPA process, the National Environmental Policy Act process, where the Department of the Navy as our landowner will be the lead agency. And through that process, um, the, the Navy will tell us, like there are some very deep substructures beneath the plant. Do we need to dig those out or, or, or what is their preference? Um, our early indication from the Navy is they want all of that, they want all of that removed. Uh, and some of that is trapped. I mentioned that we had this uh, dry storage facility with the spent fuel and the spent fuel needs somewhere to go. I think that's coming up later in the program is addressing that challenge. But right now, there are portions of um, what was actually unit one of songs, the first of three different uh, generating units, three, three different reactors. So there are remnants of unit one that are, that are uh, beneath the uh, dry storage facility. So you need to get the spent fuel offsite, clean that up. Uh, go through the NEPA process, understand from the Navy what its preference is with respect to site restoration, and then we'll do that, stabilize the site, and turn it back to the Navy. Wow, thank you. Well, Manuel, I can't thank you enough for spending time with us here today. Uh, we still have a lot to learn uh, about uh, this process, and then I guess what happens next. Uh, and so thank you again for joining us. Uh, we're going to step aside for a moment. When we get back, we'll hear from one of the nation's foremost experts on nuclear power, formerly with the Department of Energy, Tom Isaacs. So stay with us. Did you know almost two out of three American jobs are created by small business? And nine out of 10 companies have fewer than 20 employees. Our local dry cleaners, hair salons, florists, coffee shops, and restaurants, they need your support now more than ever. As the leading business advocate in the region, the South Orange County Economic Coalition encourages you to shop local to protect our hometown businesses. For our jobs, for our neighbors, for our community shop local. All right, now for some broader context on the challenge to find a solution for the nation's spent nuclear fuel problem, uh, we are joined by Tom Isaacs. Mr. Isaacs is a well-recognized national and international leader in the field of nuclear energy, nuclear waste management, nuclear security, repository siting, and public trust and confidence. 
He has served as an advisor to the Nuclear Threat Initiative and the Canadian Nuclear Waste Management Organization, and is a former member of the National Academy of Sciences Nuclear and Radiation Studies Board. While working in a variety of positions for the U.S. Department of Energy, he was involved in the siting of the Yucca Mountain Candidate Repository site, the passage of the Nuclear Waste Policy Amendments Act of 1987 that defined the U.S. waste program the development of the Blue Ribbon Commission on America's Nuclear Fuel Report. He is an independent strategic advisor to SCE for nuclear waste management and was a key member of the team of national experts that developed the song's strategic plan. So Tom, welcome. Thank you for uh, spending some time here today. We are actually gonna kick it off uh, this whole conversation with a question from the public uh, that I think might be right up your alley. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go over to Kurt Stanley who wants to know more about removing uh, spent fuel from San Onofre. So we're going to kick it over to Kurt. Hi, this is Kurt Stanley, uh, Adventures in Advertising in South Orange County, California. And I was just asking, uh, what do you think the biggest challenge or challenges are to removing the nuclear waste uh, on site? All right. Well, thank you, Kurt, for the question. Tom, your response. Well, first of all, thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, the question is a great question. What do we need to do in order to solve this problem? From a practical point of view, we need two things in my mind. We need ultimately a permanent repository to dispose of the spent nuclear fuel once and for all because it's radioactive for very, very long time periods. And so we need to isolate it from what we call the accessible environment. And we need an interim storage facility or facilities to move the waste from the various shutdown plants, prominently songs, uh, so that we can take that waste to a centralized location, store it there until the repository is ready. So what's the difficulty here? We know from a scientific and technical point of view how to do these things. Uh, other countries as well, we can talk about that more. Yeah. The r real issue is what we would call siting. Where is this facility or these facilities going to be? That's the key. We have very large social and political challenges in order to site a facility or facilities to both store this waste and ultimately dispose of this, this waste. So at the heart of it, that is the key challenge we face in this country right now. Underlying that is putting together a program that earns and keeps the trust and confidence of people so that they will work with the government and with the utilities to come up with a stable, permanent solution. Mm -hmm. Safety of, of the public and the environment are always most important. Sure. Community well-being is equally important. These issues, in my view, are bipartisan and should be supported and promoted by folks throughout the country. And I hope we will find a way to re-energize uh, activity moving toward that goal. Sure, perfect. And, uh, and a great, great response to start off this conversation. And so uh, I do have some questions as well, and we'll kind of, we'll, we'll go through these. Um, and so obviously, uh, we know that the spent nuclear fuel at the former Songs plant uh, is not just a local issue, uh, but it really is a, a national problem, even as you kind of just mentioned, because there is no national li national license repository uh, in the U.S. So can you possibly explain how we got here? Sure. In fact, you should know there's no licensed repository for the disposal of spent fuel anywhere mm -hmm. in the world, not just in the United States, although some countries are close, and I'll be happy to talk about that. We've known for decades that this is what we need to do, that we need to ultimately find a permanent disposal site, a repository, build a repository and dispose of the high level radioactive waste, this case in this form of spent nuclear fuel. In the early days of nuclear, this was not a priority. People were focused on other things like the nuclear arms race, like the development of a brand new generation of reactors that would, would ultimately meet energy needs across the country. Eventually, the country passed what was called, the Congress passed what was called the Nuclear Waste Policy Act of 1982. So we're talking about a long, long time ago. And that act, and I was in the government at the time, that act was very prescriptive. It was a politically driven schedule and a politically driven set of, of objectives that were highly constrictive as to what the Department of Energy could do and by when it needed to do it. We needed to cite not one, but two repositories by the law. That's something that often is forgotten. In addition, there was a question of whether we would need an interim storage facility. Trying to cite those facilities back then in the 80s 
We were in 24 of the contiguous 48 states, if you can imagine that, looking for sites for these things. And we did it in a very quick and sort of top-down manner. We said, we're gonna go where the site that looks the most promising for safety works, and we're really not gonna pay much attention to whether the communities and the states care about that or not. We're gonna go where the science leads us. And that just doesn't work in this kind of case. The second big problem is the schedules were so tight and so real unrealistic that we kept me not meeting them. So that was an erosion of public trust and confidence, congressional trust and confidence, because we had promises that had been made through law that the, the Department of Energy was unable to meet. So those became big, big challenges for the program. What happened ultimately five years later with 24 of the 48 states in the contiguous US all against this program at all levels in a very cohesive and uh, antagonistic way was the Congress came back to it and passed something called the Nuclear Waste Policy Amendment Act and said, you know what? Forget about the second repository. Forget about the storage facility. Forget about all the candidate sites that we have for the first repository. Just look at Yucca Mountain. Mm -hmm. They did it. I, I'll be, I'll be kind here. They did it for two reasons. The, the, the unkind reason was that it was in Nevada. Nevada was relatively politically not as strong as the other states in contention. And so it was the easy political path. The, the piece that should get added to that is at the time, from a scientific point of view, Yucca Mountain looked very, very good. And so it wasn't like we were picking an inferior site sure. and letting go of the others. We were picking a superior site. That that led to a complete loss of public trust and confidence, certainly in Nevada and throughout the country, that we didn't have a program that was stable, that was predictable, that was paying close attention to the needs of the host communities, of the host state, and those kinds of things. And so what we started after it was clear that that program wasn't going to work was it was shut. It was literally shut down. It's been shut down for a decade in this country. And instead, a Blue Ribbon Commission was formed, which I happened to be the lead advisor to back in 2010, which put forward a set of recommendations on how to revitalize the U.S. program in a way that maximized chances of success. Okay. That Blue Ribbon Commission report, I would say, has stood the test of time. It's still referred to by many folks when proposing new legislation to get this program restarted. And I should mention that there are leaders in California, like Senator Feinstein, like Congressman Levin, who have taken this to heart and have proposed legislation among others around the country. And so what we need is a renewed, vibrant, dedicated, focused program with the characteristics that are laid out in detail in the Blue Ribbon Commission report and in a number of other reports that have come out that kind of echo those prominent recommendations. So thank you. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, the Yucca Mountain approach as well as uh, what we're going to hopefully do here uh, in the U.S. Uh, but you've worked with other countries uh, to address their spent fuel stockpiles. So I guess my question is going to be how have how have they approached this issue and, they, and do they offer models that might inform our strategy here in the U.S.? Very good question. Uh, my answer is we should pay a lot of attention to what's gone in other countries. Most of them have also had failures and great difficulties at the beginning, mm -hmm. even those that have been relatively successful. But we do now have some examples of programs that are highly successful. The okay. Finns, for example, will probably open the first repository for the permanent disposal of high-level waste in the world, and they'll do it quite soon. They've already received their uh, construction license, and they're about to receive their operating license, and things seem to be moving forward. The Swedes are also well advanced. The French have a site and the Canadians are in a very interesting place where they're down to two candidate sites for the repository as they're moving forward on that program. So I would say there's lots to be learned. The, the main thing that we, we need to understand is that there's a, a way of dealing with or of approaching these programs that starts by engaging in dialogue with communities. It doesn't start by fingering them or telling them to raise their hand, but asking them if they would like to learn more about what are the implications of being a host to a repository and engage in a continuing extended dialogue and work with them to try and meet their vision of where they would like the future of their community and their region to go. And that seems to have worked very, very well in these countries where there's been a give and take leading to a true partnership 
-hmm. between the implementing organization, which in this case today would be the Department of Energy and the host communities that will accept this facility in a way that they are part of the decision-making that goes forward, not just on the science and technology, but on the entire rubric of how we're gonna make a program like this last for the generations that it will literally last. Yeah, sure. And so I guess now bringing it back here uh, to, to the US, but the Yucca Mountain approach was obviously not ideal. And so are there other case studies that we can look at uh, with optimism, I guess? Sure. First of all, we had a lot of case studies that didn't work. And mm -hmm. there's, there's a lot to be learned when you don't succeed at something. And there are a whole panoply of, of attempts to cite facilities like this in the U.S. that didn't work. There's a notable example that did work, and it's in New Mexico, and it's called the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant, now referred to as WIP. And WIP is a great example of a facility that ultimately succeeded. It's been in operation for over a decade. It is a deep geologic repository disposing of what are called transuranic waste. These are long lasting radioactive waste. They're not hot, like the spent nuclear fuel. Thermally, they're not hot, but they have isotopes in them that last a long, long time. So they have to be buried deep underground. And what happened here is what has to happen elsewhere if we're gonna be successful, which is a coming together of a local community who had a need and a desire, a state who had certain desires, and the federal government who wanted to find a place to build a repository. In the case of the local community, they were a mining community. They mined potash, potash mining cratered, and all of a sudden they didn't have an economic engine in this community of Carlsbad, New Mexico, which is pretty isolated. Uh, and so they needed something. And the town leaders and influence leaders and local entrepreneurs got together and approached the federal government and said, we hear about this nuclear waste issue. Can we talk to you about it? And the federal government, to their be benefit, said, sure, let's talk about this. Meanwhile, at the state level, which is often the case, hundreds of miles, the state capital is hundreds of miles away in Santa Fe and the population capital also far away in Albuquerque, were much less happy about this. They yeah. didn't want to see this waste coming in. But the governor at the time was concerned that New Mexico would become a target for all of the spent nuclear fuel in the country. Sure. So they cut a deal so that at the local level, the state level, and at the federal level, it was a win, win, win. The local community got the repository for transuranic waste, WIP. It's been, it was cited, it was built, it was licensed, it's open for operation, been operating for over a decade. They did have an incident there, but it was relatively speaking minor, although it caused some commotion. The people in the area are still very happy with WIP. They'd like to expand its mission because they like the, the money that comes in, the jobs that come in, the economic benefits, the notoriety, the science, the technology. It's all been wonderful. The governor could claim that he kept spent fuel out of the state of New Mexico, which he did, because there was an agreement that WIP would never hold spent fuel, only transuranic waste. So he could claim legitimately that he had had a role. And he also negotiated a deal with the federal government a, to build a bypass around the state capital of Santa Fe so that the waste wouldn't come through the city, but would go around. And wow. B, he convinced the Department of Energy to give money to the state government to create their own what was called environmental evaluation group to independently overlook the science and technology as the program was implemented and to be a stickler about making sure things were done well. And that was another public trust enhancing move. So that's a short version of an example of where we have a win-win-win. You couldn't duplicate it in the same place. You couldn't duplicate it in the same time. But the kind of thinking, the kind of relationships that get built, the time it takes, the flexibility that it takes, the, all of that went into this WIP being a success and will need in some way to go into a success with these other facilities. Interesting. Well, thank you. Well, we're about to talk to Caroline Choi. Uh, about the strategic plan. And so I, I do want to get your per perspective. Uh, you were a senior advisor, obviously, you said, to the Blue Ribbon Commission on America's uh, Nuclear fu uh, Future, which produced a report as well, as you said. So I guess, how does the BRC report compare to uh, SCE's SCE strategic plan? That, that's a great question. I had the pleasure of working on both of those reports, and I would say they are great companions. Good. 
the Blue Ribbon Commission report was ultimately, let's call it a top-down report. Sure. It was a view from Washington of what the national problem is and what are the things we need to do in order to start solving that national problem. The SCE report is looking from the point of view of a waste holder, somebody who has this waste at a shutdown plant who cannot fully decommission and restore that site unless and until there's a place to send the spent fuel. So those reports are, are bookends, if you will, to a very complex problem and provide very complementary perspectives, in my view, on what needs to happen. And so I, I think they're going to hopefully resonate with people. And my, my hope is, I think the Blue Ribbon Commission report already, people understand the pro key provisions in there, some of which I've reflected to you in the course of this conversation. I think I'm hopeful that that the action plan that is put together by Southern California Edison, which includes the creation of a new coalition uh, that in includes uh, membership by key people in the local community, I'm hopeful that that will start to drive some renewed uh, dialogue and action, both from the utility point of view, from the industry point of view, from the NGO point of view, from the congressional point of view, and from the executive branch point of view, that this is something that we can no longer legitimately put off. I, I find it fairly disgraceful, frankly, that we at this point in time in the US have not had a viable program for a decade and have not put in place the necessary measures to move forward. I think we have a great opportunity. I think we have the, the kinds of thoughts and the kinds of people now more and more engaging in this. And I think this is something whose time has come. It's a bipartisan issue in my mind. These spent nuclear fuel facilities are spread around the country. They don't know if it's Democrat or Republican. It's yeah. not a House or Senate issue. It's not just an Eastern or Western issue. It's a national issue. It has safety implications. It has environmental implications. It has national security implications. And it's very, very important that we as a country, and it's a real opportunity as we as a country, finally get together and do the right thing. Well, Tom, I can't thank you enough for really the historical context and as well as your international insights uh, on what other countries are doing. We're actually about to talk to Caroline Choi, as I said, uh, and Supervisor uh, Lisa Bartlett uh, to hear about some of the, again, the strategic plan and, and what they're doing locally, uh, even building the coalitions, as you just mentioned. So Tom, thank you again. And uh, we're gonna jump right into talking to Caroline. All right, now joining us are Orange County Supervisor Lisa Bartlett and Caroline Choi, two of the executive board members of the newly formed coalition, Action for Spent Fuel Solutions Now. And so what, how we're gonna do this is we're gonna introduce Caroline first, uh, ask some questions, and we're gonna go into uh, Supervisor Bartlett's segment as well. Uh, but Caroline Choi, Senior Vice President of Corporate Affairs at SCE, one of the nation's largest electric utilities and its parents' company, Edison International. Caroline is responsible for overseeing government affairs, public affairs, corporate communications, and corporate philanthropy at the national, state, and local levels. Before joining SCE in 2012, Choi was executive director of environmental services at Strategy and Strategy, excuse me, at Progress Energy, now Duke Energy, where she was responsible for leading environmental permitting, compliance, and policy. She served the company in various roles, including director, energy policy and strategy, and manager, federal public affairs. Choi is active in national policy and community engagement, where she serves on the executive board of the Smart Electric Power Alliance and nationwide a nationwide organization that supports utilities in the implementation and deployment of clean energy and distributed resources. She also chairs the board of Below's, a nonprofit dedicated to accelerating the shift to electric transportation through public-private collaboration and public engagement. In addition, she serves on the boards of the Electric Transportation Community Development Corporation, Los Angeles Business Council, and the National Forest Foundation. Uh, Carolyn, again, that sounds like the short bio. Um, but thank you for uh, being here today. I'm going to jump right into a couple different questions. Um, and so first, uh, Tom Isaacs provided us a sobering status of the spent fuel challenge here in the U.S., along with uh, a couple case studies uh, that provide some optimism for a path forward. Uh, you at SCE just finished a two-year initiative to develop a strategic plan 
for the off-site relocation of spent fuel. And so my question here is, uh, what options for relocating the spent fuel uh, were considered for this plan? Great. Well, thank you, Steve, for having me. And it's great to be here with Supervisor Bartlett. And I think it's so timely, particularly uh, Earth Week, right? So um, so with respect to the plan, it was a three-volume plan. It was released uh, in mid-March. It includes a comprehensive strategic plan. You mentioned an action plan as well as a conceptual transportation plan. And the strategic plan identifies and evaluates a broad range of potential alternatives for relocating the spent fuel offsite, something that we all support. In the end, what our independent experts found was that the most likely path forward to getting the spent fuel offsite is a, is a two-pronged approach. It's pursuing federally supported consolidated interim storage, which is um, interim storage, and then in doing so in tandem with restarting work on a permanent geologic repository. So consolidated interim storage can, uh, can be done above ground, and so it can be accomplished relatively quickly. A permanent geologic repository that's built deep below ground um, is much more complex. It'll take many more years to complete, uh, maybe decades. So um, we believe that a host community for a consolidated interim storage facility is going to want to have confidence that a permanent geologic repository will be delivered so that interim storage does not become permanent. And our experts also identified a number of actions that SCE can take to ensure that the Songs facility and its spent fuel are prepared to move as soon as possible when a facility becomes available. Sure, thank you. And so what, what is the uh, stance or what does the Biden administration think of the plan? Well, you know, let's recognize that the Biden administration is still in its first 100 days with some major issues like the COVID-19 pandemic response and getting the economy back to where it needs to be. Um, but the first indication of the Biden administration's view came in DOE, the U.S. Department of Energy Secretary Granholm's confirmation hearing, where Secretary Granholm committed to pursuing consent-based solutions. And the secretary is really familiar with the issue. She comes from Michigan. Michigan has three nuclear plants operating today, as well as a couple that are no longer operating. She's very aware of the need to um, address the spent fuel solution. Uh, we're also committed to consent-based siting, which was included in the strategic plan. Um, former President Obama's Blue Ribbon Commission talked about waste disposal and concluded that nuclear waste disposal could only be successful with active community involvement, and we fully agree with that. So uh, moving down then to Congress, I mean, what has Congress uh, been doing in terms of uh, this plan as well, or even just uh looking at storage. Yeah. Well, Congress is, is uh, doing some things. They appropriated $20 million last year to explore a federal consolidated interim storage facility. Rep. Uh, Doris Matsui, who's from Northern California, she reintroduced her bill to create a legislative framework to develop a consolidated interim storage program at the U.S. Department of Energy, and it gives priority to decommission nuclear plants to move that spent fuel to interim storage facilities. Um, Earlier, you talked uh, with Tom about Senator Feinstein and, and Congressman Levin. They're also active in the space. So in recent years, there has been bipartisan support on this issue, but we just haven't had enough votes to get it um, across the finish line. Got it. Now, you kind of alluded to it a little bit earlier, but why is it so important to sort of, I, I guess, to have a mix, if you will, of uh, interim storage and permanent storage? Yeah. Yeah, well, we've learned that we shouldn't put all our eggs in one basket. Um, our experience with Yucca Mountain in Nevada has taught us that. Um, a permanent repository is going to take many years to site, to license, and to construct it. And so consolidated interim storage allows us to relocate the spent fuel off the coast while a permanent repository is identified, licensed, and constructed. Well, good. Well, thank you. So my uh, my last question for you, Caroline, is I, I would love to hear your thoughts on the legislative priorities as it relates to solving the spent fuel challenge uh, here in the U.S. It sounds like you spend a lot of time at uh, state and federal uh, yeah. with state and federal lawmakers. So curious to hear your thoughts. Yeah, so we actually have three priorities uh, legislatively at Congress. Um, program management, funding, and then updating um, old statutes to reflect today's environment. With, reflect, with respect to federal program management, you know, we think there is a need to reestablish the office within the U.S. Department of Energy that's responsible for overseeing the disposal of the nuclear spent fuel in the country. It was disbanded in 2010, but that office or some other entity responsible for managing um, the nation's spent fuel must begin to 
to do the work to relocate the spent fuel from songs and elsewhere, um, other facilities. So our strategic plan found that ideally that entity ought to be an autonomous federal agency so that it has the continuity to work seamlessly without being subject to the changes and priorities that come along with changes in administrations every four or eight years. Um, on funding, we need to make sure that Congress provides the funding necessary that the for the Biden and Harris administration to develop programs that are necessary to relocate the spent fuel. Um, that's separate from the roughly $41 billion that's already collected from customers across the country uh, that from nuclear plant owners. Um, so that $41 billion um, has been collected for the construction of a permanent repository. Ideally, the entity that's responsible for the management of the federal program would have full access to the $41 billion that nuclear customers have already prepaid, as well as, again, dollars from Congress to work on a consolidated interim storage solution. And then finally, we think it's time to refresh the law that's governing the disposal of spent fuel. So the Nuclear Waste Policy Act was passed back in 1987. It identified Yucca Mountain in Nevada as the only federal site that's authorized uh, for the disposal of spent nuclear fuel. And so it's really essential to amend that act to allow for interim storage and other consent-based sites for a permanent repository. Okay, thank you. Uh, those are my questions that I have, but we're actually going to have some from uh, uh, from the public, if you will, a little bit later. But we're actually going to jump right into uh, speaking to Supervisor Lisa Bartlett. Uh, so Supervisor, thanks for joining us today. Pleasure. Okay, just a little background on Supervisor Bartlett. Orange County Supervisor Lisa Bartlett was first elected to the Board of Supervisors representing the 5th District in 2014 and is now in her second term after being reelected in 2018. She is immediate past president of the California State Association of Counties and was recently appointed as at-large member to the National Association of Counties. In addition to serving on the board of directors for the Orange County Transportation Authority, Orange County Fire Authority, Transportation Corridor Agency, or TCA, South Coast Air Quality Management District, and numerous other boards and commissions, she represents the Orange County Board of Supervisors on the Songs Community Engagement Panel and co-chairs a new coalition advocating for removal of spent fuels from the Songs site. So again, Supervisor, uh, welcome. Uh, I'm gonna jump right into it. Okay, so my first question, uh, Supervisor Bartlett, again, representing South Orange County on the Board of Supervisors, and as a member of the Songs Community Engagement Panel, you have a long history with Songs. Now you are taking a leading role with this new coalition to address the spent fuel now stored there. So please tell us a little bit more about the coalition. Uh, what's its mission and, and who's involved? Well, I'm really excited about our new stakeholder coalition. The new coalition is named Action for Spent Fuel Solutions Now. And it's in the early stages, but will bring a very unified voice and bring our voice to the table. The coalition has a singular purpose, which is to demand the federal government fulfill its obligation to provide offsite storage and a permanent disposal solution for the spent nuclear fuel at the San Onofre Nuclear Generating Station, or SONGS as it's known, as well as other nuclear sites across the state and the nation. And I'm very proud to serve as co-chair alongside Supervisor Jim Desmond. We have a strong executive board comprised of SONGS owners, Southern California Edison, San Diego Gas and Electric, and the city of Riverside. Uh, membership in the coalition is open to individuals and organizations alike, and I encourage anyone who wishes to support our mission to join. We could all use the help um, from everyone who wants to be a stakeholder. We are off to a great start, and with support from members of business, labor, Native American, and environmental communities, as well as local governments and public safety officials as well. In Orange County, current supporting members include the Orange County Sheriff, Don Barnes, the Orange County Fire Authority, mayors and council members from across the county, Orange County Coast Keepers, Laborers International Union of North America, Local 89, the Orange County Business Council, many chambers of commerce, including San Clemente, Dana Point, Laguna Beach, Newport Beach, San Juan Capistrano, Irvine, and others. We also have as a supporter, the Orange County Taxpayers Association, and as we grow the coalition, we anticipate forming an advisory board 
to provide input from different community stakeholders and to bolster um, our advocacy efforts. The coalition will be engaged not only with our local congressional leaders and US senators, but other key decision makers in Washington who are responsible for authorizing and implementing the federal policies needed to allow the spent fuel to be relocated. That means the House and Senate committees that have jurisdiction over legislation and appropriations related to spent fuel programs, the Department of Energy, and even the White House. The bottom line is we need to make the relocation of spent fuel a federal governmental priority. We need to have a seat at the table when new policies and legislation are being developed and support our allies in Congress to get the necessary legislation enacted. The federal government had an obligation to begin removing the spent fuel from San Onofre in 1998, so a long time ago, uh -huh. more than two decades to be exact. And despite Song's customers paying nearly $1 billion into the fund to dispose of the nuclear spent fuel, we stand here today with 123 canisters of spent nuclear fuel sitting on our coastline. We're asking the federal government now to fulfill its obligation. Well, thank you. Uh, you, you mentioned a, n a number of uh, elected officials and organizations, quite a long list, um, that are in Orange County and San Diego County supporting this coalition. So uh, can you tell me where the Orange County Board of Supervisors stands on this issue? For many years, the county's legislative platform has prioritized advocating for the relocation of spent fuel. Mm -hmm. So supporting um, this effort through the coalition is a natural extension of our board adopted policy. And while I serve as co-chair of the coalition, to have the full county support, the Board of Supervisors in particular, um, we're gonna need to adopt a resolution. So I plan to introduce the necessary resolution um, for the board's review and approval at our next board meeting. I'm optimistic that they will agree that if we're going to solve this problem, we need to work more closely with local and regional stakeholders Collectively, we need to be more engaged with those in Washington who have the ultimate responsibility to solve this issue. And that's exactly what this coalition aims to do. I'm hopeful that our county resolution will serve as a template for cities and others that want to show their support for relocating the spent fuel stored at San Onofre. Yeah, and, and you know, we heard from Caroline a little bit ago about what the federal government needs to do, is doing. And so I'm curious, uh, do you guys, does the, does the coalition have a take on, on what they want to see the federal government do uh, to relocate the spent fuel? And then what can the coalition do? What is it doing uh, to help make this happen? As Caroline noted, there are three key things that must happen in Washington. The administration needs to implement policies and programs to advance both near and long-term solutions, federally supported offsite interim storage, and a federal permanent repository. Congress needs to provide annual funding to support those policies and programs, and Congress and the administration need to work together to update the Nuclear Waste Policy Act to allow for offsite interim storage. In terms of the coalition, we first need to organize ourselves locally and grow the coalition. There has never been a coalition like this in Southern California or the state for that matter, but our collective voices will make a difference. But we need to do some work to become a real show of force by building our list of active and committed supporters. Second, we need to engage those who decide if and how this problem will be solved. This is going to require face time with decision makers in Washington, including the Biden administration, namely the Department of Energy, the House and Senate members that have or are developing bills on spent fuel, such as Representative Matsui from Sacramento, members responsible for providing both funding for spent fuel programs, as well as those responsible for authorizing changes to the outdated law governing spent fuel and members who represent the dozens of like-minded communities around the country dealing with their own spent fuel programs and problems. Third, we need to be in this for the long haul. This is not something that is going to be short-term. More than two decades have passed since the federal government has been required to begin removing the spent fuel from songs and nearly 35 years since the law governing spent fuel has been updated. This is simply unacceptable, and the residents surrounding Songs and every other nuclear facility around the country with spent fuel on site expect and deserve better. 
We need to be prepared that change will take time and a sustained effort is essential to our success. I accept this challenge. I'm willing to roll up my sleeves and make the trips to Washington with our coalition partners to do whatever is necessary to help solve this problem. So on to then the kind of that topic that you just mentioned, but working with uh, congressional leaders um, over the over the past couple years, uh, congressional leaders like Senator Dianne Feinstein and and Representative uh, Mike Levin have been very involved in the efforts to find a solution, including legislation to authorize moving the fuel, as well as providing uh, the funds, as been uh, noted multiple times, uh, to the Department of Energy to restart its nuclear waste program. And so is the coalition working with these uh, with these members, um, along with, uh, you know, the, the plethora of other uh, coalitions involved? Absolutely. This is a team effort. Mm-hmm. Representative Levin and Senator Feinstein have been real champions, and we intend to work closely with both of them. We are really grateful for all that they've done to elevate this issue, to frame potential solutions with the legislation that they've sponsored, and to secure the appropriations needed to restart a spent fuel program within the Department of Energy. The coalition can be an asset to them by helping build support for their efforts, both in the state and in Washington. For example, the coalition could work with the California State Association of Counties and the National Association of Counties to enlist their support to advance solutions for relocating the spent fuel. These organizations can be very influential with congressional members as well as the administration. So uh, yeah, my last question here for you, Supervisor, is uh, while those representatives uh, have been working on this issue for quite a long time, they are only two members uh, of the 535 members, of course, uh, of Congress. And so uh, who else does the coalition need to work with uh, at the federal level to really begin making the changes needed uh, to relocate uh, the spent fuel? We need to work with all the members um, within the Biden administration and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, all of the um, the key folks there in Washington, DC that have any means to move legislation forward, but also to get the appro- appropriations for funding mm-hmm. because the enabling legislation that we need is not only moving through the legislative process, but we need the funding to be yeah. able to move the spent fuel offsite into the interim storage areas. And so it's it's a joint effort. Um, um, It's a bipartisan effort. And we're going to look to every member that we can possibly secure, as well as key members in the Biden administration to assist us in our goals and objectives. Well, thank you, Supervisor. Thank you, uh, Caroline, for uh, answering all my questions I had today. But we do have some questions from the public. uh, And this one is from uh, Maria Gonzalez. And so I'm going to kick it over uh, to Maria. Hi, my name is Maria. I'm glad to hear that there's a new coalition that has formed to move the spent fuel from the San Onofre to a safe location. My question is, what happens next and what can the public do to help? Okay, Maria, thank you for the question. And so, Caroline, I'm going to start with you. Uh, What can the public do to help? Well, great. Thank you, Steve. And thank you, Maria. What a great question. I think Supervisor Bartlett put it best, which is to get engaged. This coalition that, that has just been kicked off Uh, could really use um, all the support from local community. So uh, to join this coalition, to uh, talk to elected officials because of the importance of this effort and the need to build a movement to get Congress to act, uh, to appropriate the funds, to to, to do, uh, make the decisions necessary to really find that solution. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. And Supervisor, I know you kind of already spoke about it, but any, anything to add and then any closing remarks? Well, the single most important thing the public can do at this point is to help us by joining the coalition. And they can do that by going to the website at www.spentfuelsolutionsnow.com, www.spentfuelsolutionsnow.com, and signing up to be a supporting member. We need everyone in the public to, to really get engaged, and that's a great way to really help us in our effort right now is to join the coalition and be a supporting member. Um, They'll also receive updates on the latest developments on the issue if they're a supporting member, and they'll get updates on the coalition's progress to relocate the spent fuel. 
So signing up will also alert you to emails, letter writing and call in campaigns that we'll be progressing with. And we're also looking forward to um, being the leading advocate for policies, programs, legislation, and to actually help solve the problem. When it comes time for the coalition to take action, we need the biggest, broadest set of voices to ensure that Congress hears us loud and clear. And two other ways that people can help, um, contact your local city council members. Let them know this is a really important issue for you and urge them to adopt their own resolutions to join the coalition. Also follow us on Twitter at ASFS Now and Facebook at ASFS Now and Instagram backslash ASFS Now and help get the word out about who we are and what we're doing. It's going to take a broad-based coalition to make a difference. And now is the best time to get started. Perfect, thank you. Uh, Caroline Choi, thank you. Supervisor Bartlett, thank you. As well as our previous guests, uh, Manuel Camargo and Tom Isaacs. Uh, reminder to learn more about this new Songs Coalition, as the supervisor just said, Action for Spent Fuel Solutions Now. Please visit spentfuelsolutionsnow.com. If you would like a copy of today's presentation, uh, please visit our website at economiccoalition.com. I also want to thank you, our viewers, for joining us today. If you are interested in becoming a member of SOSEC, we have many sponsorship levels available on our website. Again, that is economiccoalition.com. I'm Steve Lamont. Thank you for joining us today, and we'll see you next time.